Hello and welcome to the latest seminar from the Glasgow Centre for Population Health, supporting new approaches to improve health and tackle inequality. In this video cast, Professor Kevin Fenton discusses a public health approach to incorporating anti-racism and structural discrimination in tackling racial and ethnic health disparities. It was recorded via Zoom on the 12th of June, 2023. A very warm welcome to this webinar that's hosted by the Glasgow Centre for Population Health and the Faculty of Public Health. My name is Paul Johnston and it's my privilege to chair the session. I am the Chief Executive of Public Health Scotland. I've been for a few months now and I was delighted to have this invitation to welcome Professor Kevin Fenton President of the Faculty of Public Health, who will be giving our keynote address this afternoon, looking at a public health approach to incorporating anti-racism and structural discrimination in tackling racial and ethnic health disparities. The importance of the subject is clear when we see uh, just how many have chosen to join today. Kevin Fenton, as I mentioned, is the president of the Faculty of Public Health, a senior public health expert, an infectious disease epidemiologist who has worked in many public health executive leadership roles across the United Kingdom and internationally with a specialist interest in tackling health inequalities, infectious disease prevention and control, climate justice and urban health. Um, Kevin, could I invite you to speak to us now? Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Paul, and good afternoon, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon and a privilege to be able to do this lecture and to reflect on what I think is a, an evolving part of our public health practice. It's a challenging part of the societal conversations that we need to have, but it's an area that presents and provides tremendous opportunities for us to do things differently in order to achieve different outcomes. Um, but to set the lecture up this afternoon, what I wanted to do is to cover a few things. First, to begin with a reflection on racism and our evolution of our thinking on racism and structural racism, and why it's important for us to begin incorporating this into our practice as far as tackling racial and ethnic health disparities is concerned. Second, I wanted to use our experience, our collective experience of going through the COVID pandemic, which really shone a light on both pre-existing and exacerbated inequalities, to really think about what are the nature and scale, the nature and scale of the inequalities attributable to structural racism and what we might be doing to address them. Third, and finally, what I want to do is to reflect on frameworks that we're currently using uh, here in London, but I know across the country and around the world in thinking about a much more comprehensive approach to tackling structural racism and how that can be integrated into the work that we're doing across health and care systems. And of course, looking then at the implications for public health practice. And then finally, I'll end with a call to action. Uh, uh, one for us all to think about our individual actions in addressing this agenda, but also our collective actions as well. Throughout the course of the lecture today, I'm going to be highlighting the leadership of some of my own um, heroes in public health, but also heroes in tackling inequalities. And I start with this quote from Martin Luther King, who said that of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is perhaps the most shocking and inhuman. And it really does focus the hearts and minds about the nature of the challenges that we face when it comes to providing equitable health and care to all in need. But it also highlights that the challenges that we're facing are not new ones. They've existed for decades. And whereas we've made great progress, there are lots of areas where we need to continue to push forward. So I mentioned what I'll be covering today are looking at racism as a public health issue, race and health in the UK. We look at the COVID pandemic and then we'll focus on anti-racism in public health and health practice. It's just to begin then with thinking about our concepts of race and racism. 
Mara Jones is a professor of public health who is working here in the UK at the moment, but she was previously the president of the American Public Health Association. And she has written uh, and developed programs looking at the impact of racism on health. And I wanted to start with Kamara's definition of racism because I think it's such a comprehensive one, which talks about racism being a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value which is based on the social interpretation of how one looks. And in this regard, we're talking about using race as the, 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 the definer of how one looks, looking at differences in our skin color. Now, the ultimate impact of this is that this assigning of value and this association of interpret association of structuring opportunity results in unfair disadvantages of some individuals and communities and unfairly advantages other individuals and communities. But most importantly, as a result of this structural racism, it saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. So in this definition, not only are we speaking about the societal roots of differences and how differences are valued, but we then begin to think about what it actually does in terms of advantage and privilege and how all of society is at a loss because of the impact of structural racism. So when we look at the literature, the literature then goes into thinking about a lot of the definitions of race and racism. And I wanted to just highlight a few things which I think are particularly important for us in our public health practice. The first is that uh, the terms of race and racism are not interchangeable constructs. Each has its own definition, conceptualization, the way we measure it, and in fact, where we look at it in public health research varies across societies. Reminder that race is a social construct. There's no biological basis for the definition per se, uh, but where racism does refer to this social system that reinforces social and racial group inequality and hierarchy. So really it's a social construct which is, has been used to define hierarchy within the community and to reinforce uh, racial group inequity. Racialization is another key definition, and this is the process through which meaning and value are ascribed to socially dis determined racial categories. And each racial category occupies a different place within the social hierarchy. And this is really important because where you move, wherever you are in different countries and settings, you may have those hierarchies being different according to the racial groups, the ethnic groups, which are within that society. So racism, here in the United Kingdom will have a different flavor given our demographic profile, the history of our society compared to the US or to uh, France or Germany. So it's really important to understand that process uh, of giving meaning and value is a socially prescribed one. And it's one that really will determine the social hierarchy and the impact of racism within those societies. As we think about the process of racialization, there's also other uh, core concepts that we need to also put on the table as well. The fact is that racism itself, because it values different types of races over other and systematically disadvantages uh, some races compared to others, it does mean that we have a process where irrespective of one's socioeconomic status, you will still have the impact of racism uh, manifesting itself. Second, recognizing that racism uh, operates and intersects with other types of disadvantage and discrimination. So whether it's uh, anti-Gypsyism, anti-Semitism, anti-Asian racism, uh, but also integration, uh, intersection with uh, gender, sexual orientation, uh, your migrant status and disability. So that intersectionality is also important as well. So it's a few concepts just to get us started this afternoon on the importance of race and racism and defining these as we proceed. So what we're trying to think about then is how we begin to think about this complex reality and this problem, uh, which sometimes has been described as a wicked problem, and how we begin to use and think about this and integrate it into our practice in public health. In fact, racism now should be considered a fundamental determinant of health, and I'll be going and, and speaking about why in a couple of slides. But in doing so, it recognizes that this is a structural factor 
societally determined, which continues to endure and adapt over time. And it's really important because it influences many mechanisms within our societies, which are important for generating and affecting health. So structural racism will influence the funding, uh, the policies, the practices and the pathways, which ultimately are generating health within society. And the health consequences of living in a racially stratified society are often illustrated by a variety of differential health outcomes or health disparities. And we'll be going through some of these in subsequent slides. So important to recognize as well that there are different types of racism as well. Uh, and here is a definition which uh, we've used, taken from literature from the United States, on three different ways of conceptualizing types of racism that societies and individuals may face. There's the internalized racism, which is looking at acceptance by a member of stigmatized races of the negative messages about one's own abilities and intrinsic worth. So the degree to which uh, members of minority, minority groups will internalize the negative stereotypes about that group and how that then influences their engagement and trust and confidence, self-worth and self-esteem. Second, institutionalized racism, which is the differential access to good services and opportunities of society determined by race. And then finally, structural racism, which is the normalization and the legitimization of a range of different types of dynamics within a society, which in the case of racism, uh, routinely advantages white individuals while producing cumulative and chronic adverse outcomes for people of color. So in a sense, the structural racism embeds and reinforces the various structures, whether it's institutionalized racism and also results in that impact on the individual as well through internalized racism. So the impact then of racism is felt both at the individual level as well as at the societal level. Uh, the experiences of racism uh, results in both the chronic discrimination, it results in stress to the individual, it may result in depression and anxiety that really becomes part of the lived experiences of people who are on the receiving end of being in a racist society and dealing with racism. Um, and that is further compounded by the intersection between racism as one form of structural discrimination with other types of structural discrimination as well. So in communities which are racialized and may be experiencing racism, factors such as adverse childhood experiences, adverse adult experiences to racism, uh, it, it combined with economic disadvantage, community violence in some circumstances, may result in that long-term uh, toxic stress on individuals, resulting in premature morbidity and premature mortality. And this is well-defined in the literature in terms of the impact of stress and how that impacts on individuals. At the societal level, we think about structural racism and I've already defined uh, structural racism in the previous slide, but what I want to do is to go through this in a little bit more detail here. And this is about how societies through structural racism will limit opportunities for social, economic and financial advancement of different groups in society based upon the color of their skin. And this in turn results in uh, dynamic interplay between race and social determinants and health to result in different and negative health outcomes. So in other words, uh, racialized communities, which are at the experiencing structural racism are also likely to have poor access to quality schools. They may have poor access to good paying jobs, lower access to higher incomes, unable to accumulate wealth, and may be living in poor neighborhoods or less well neighborhoods, but also unable to access or navigate the health and care system. So that dynamic interaction between one's experience of racism and how it intersects with other social determinants becomes really important in looking at the variations in health outcomes. And it's also important that you know, because there is the concentration of power among privileged groups uh, and the devaluation of populations of other groups, that you begin to think about uh, how this can cut across other types of disadvantage as well. So again, in this example, just highlighting the fact that irrespective of socioeconomic status, that 
Black people in the US continue to experience striking uh, disparities in, in morbidity as well as mortality. Um, and um, wealth accumulation in Black people in the US is le less uh, compared to their white counterparts due to their experience of unemployment uh, and lower wealth accumulation. So again, structural issues which are baked in. So even when you adjust for a socioeconomic status, you're still seeing the differences across uh, racial and ethnic groups. So therefore this really, I think, given the nature of the challenge and the problems that we have, must be seen as a public health issue. And it's important for us to have the language to be able to talk about this, to be able to have difficult conversations about integrating this into our public health and health and care practice, and to begin to find the space for us to have the conversations on this issue. So, in this slide, we talk about the reason why racism and structural racism is a public health issue. As you'll see in subsequent slides, there's a clear understanding from members of the public that their lived experience dictates that this is a major issue. With 25 to 40% of participants in surveys in the US reporting, in, in the United Kingdom reporting that they would discriminate against ethnic minority groups. A third of people from ethnic minority backgrounds reporting that they constrain their lives through fear of racism. Um, reported hate crimes in the United Kingdom we know have been increasing over the past decade and have increased uh, and continue to do so as we've emerged from the COVID-19 pandemic. We know that uh, there are substantial disparities between ethnic minority groups and majority groups in housing, education, uh, experience of the criminal justice system. Uh, and this we know is related both to social and economic deprivation, but increasingly we're seeing where racism and structural racism is playing a part in this as well. And although race and racism is really relevant to help, you know, the way in which relevant to health, the way in which we are understanding it and studying it also needs to be strengthened as well. So not only are we recognizing this as a, a challenge, but I think it's really important for the public health community to begin thinking about how we measure this problem, how we think about the effective interventions which are in place to address them, and what are the tools available for us to address and to support communities and individuals uh, that are dealing with racism and systems which are dealing with racism as well. So really framing this as a public health issue is a key part, I think, of beginning to address the challenge that we have. In the next slide, I wanted to just reinforce that framing is critical for us as we think about racism as a public health issue. And framing racism as a public health issue really allows organizations and, and governments to, to really begin to think about the crisis of structural racism in much more broader systematic and evidence-informed ways. And so it allows us to begin thinking about given the problems that we're defining and how we're addressing them. What are the strategic initiatives and policies, practices, what education might be needed, support services might be needed to address the problem. So this is a reason why we begin to frame racism as a public health issue. And in fact, the Association of Directors of Public Health in the UK, the Faculty of Public Health, have made public statements about racism being a public health issue. And this has exactly allowed us to do the sort of detailed work to take our response forward. I'm going to move on very quickly then to uh, racism and health in the UK, and just really highlighting some of the data on what we now know about how racism is manifesting itself and its impact on health. We know that there are a number of studies now which have been published, which highlight uh, the impact of racism on health and the experience of minoritized communities receiving poor treatment, uh, uh, dis depending, irrespective of their character or abilities, and the lived experiences of many minorities across the country about structural racism. Uh, and again, the experience of the pandemic really brought this to a fore, both in terms of the pandemic response and how it disproportionately affected different communities, but also what was happening societally in terms of the wider determinants of uh, COVID risk and how those wider determinants were influenced by structural racism as well. 
I've highlighted also data from the uh, Health Foundation, which really talks about how discrimination is affecting people in a variety of ways, including access to education and employment opportunities. And then again, how that has a, a significant impact on uh, health outcomes. So how does structural racism operate in our health and care system? I think there are a number of pathways which are now becoming absolutely clear in how we can think about structural racism as an impact on health and, and healthcare. The first is how it limits access and barriers to healthcare. Again, this might be through um, uh, cultural barriers, linguistic barriers, access barriers, the ability to navigate the systems, the confidence that you and I may have in picking up NHS 111, having a conversation, describing our symptoms, and of course, uh, uh, pushing for access to effective services. That can have a huge impact uh, and difference across community or uh, individuals and communities, which can have a significant impact on uh, uh, ability to access healthcare. We see structural racism playing out in terms of bias in clinical decision-making. Uh, for example, we know that this may result in implicit bias in uh, how decisions are made clinically, uh, negative impact on patient care, and it may also influence the kinds of investigations that patients receive. We've seen this in terms of access to pain medication for minorities, as where uh, a number of studies have shown that a black minority ethnic communities are less likely to access very powerful uh, pain medications when required uh, compared to their white counterparts. We know that as we've been looking at significant differences in matern maternal health outcomes that we've been seeing in a number of research studies about bias in clinical decision making and how that plays out in the maternity space as well. Um, we see structural racism playing out in uh, inequalities in patient outcomes uh, and this results in patients experiencing poorer health outcomes, diagnostic delays, suboptimal treatment, or worse health outcomes for certain health conditions. We also see structural racism in health and care systems manifesting itself in workforce disparities as well. Uh, who has, who, which groups have senior roles and positions within health and care systems, which rule, which communities are overrepresented in lower paid and lower status roles, who within your organization is more likely to report bullying, harassment, and discrimination? Uh, and, and which uh, groups uh, within your organization are likely to experience poor health or ill health as a result of their experience in the workplace? So we see structural racism playing out in workforce disparities as well. And then finally, we see structural racism uh, appearing in clinical trials and the lack of diversity in clinical trials as well. So a real challenge there in terms of who gets invited to participate in research trials, the applicability, relevance in a, uh, of trial data to different ethnic and community groups, uh, and how this manifests in terms of the um, applicability of the findings of these trials to uh, different communities. So the lack of diversity in clinical trials then plays out into how patients trust the results of those trials, their willingness uh, to uh, take up uh, new interventions. We saw this playing out uh, with the COVID vaccine and the COVID vaccine availability. But increasingly, I think patients are wanting to know now, you know, how diverse was the patient group, the studies which generated the findings, uh, are they relevant to me? What are the side effects, side effects profile, etc. So the lack of diversity within clinical trials has a huge impact now on, on the willingness of patients and communities to trust this kind of research. So this slide just really highlights the ways in which structural racism operates in health and care systems. Ultimately, we know that prior to the pandemic, we saw significant variations in ethnic health inequalities across the United Kingdom. And this slide just highlights some of the key areas where we saw some of those differences. I've already referred to some of the differences in uh, maternal health outcomes where black women are four times more likely than white women to die in pregnancy. And these are data from the Race and Health Observatory uh, uh, here in England. Uh, in Britain, South Asians have a 40% higher death rate from coronary heart disease than the general population. We know that South Asian and black people are two to four times more likely to develop type two diabetes than white people in the UK. 
and that African-American men are up to three times more likely to develop prostate cancer than white men in the same age. And of course, we know that from our experience through the COVID-19 pandemic, that there were significant differences in mortality from COVID-19 uh, among minority groups compared to the white British population. So prior to the pandemic, there were long-standing health, health inequalities, which were well-described uh, operating across the United Kingdom. Uh, and these are just a few of those points. In the next slide, we just want to highlight that these ethnic inequalities are not only observed in uh, the health sector, but again, we begin to see them manifesting themselves, uh, these disparities in other spheres of life as well, and these in these social and structural determinants. So for employment, we know that there are significant differences in your likelihood of being employed and unemployed by racial and ethnic groups. Some of the data are on this slide, 76% of people of, of white people who were employed in 2021 compared to 67% of people from all other ethnic groups. Um, we know that there are significant differences in unemployment um, uh, with one in 10, so I'm looking at the phone, <laughs> it's not easy to see, um, well, significant differences in the level of unemployment across racial and ethnic groups, with Pakistani and Bangladeshi background individuals being uh, more likely to be unemployed than other ethnic groups. And again, we see differences in uh, the sort of rates of self-employment uh, across racial and ethnic groups as well, uh, and how that influences the amount of pay uh, that individuals are able to receive. And then finally, just in terms of another social determinant of health, very significant differences in housing. Um, again, here that we see that uh, households that are most likely to, to rent social housing were headed by someone in the African, Caribbean or other Black, Bangladeshi, Irish or Arab groups or mixed groups compared to, to white groups uh, in the United Kingdom. And ethnic minority households are much more likely to rent privately than white households. Again, some of the data are included on this slide uh, and really just they're here just to highlight some of the structural differences that we see in employment or housing across racial and ethnic groups. I'm going to move us on just in the interest of time because I'm mindful that we were going to have to wrap up shortly. Uh, Michael Marmot really summarized, I think, quite nicely why this is important for us to really uh, have a clear uh, focus on tackling these wider determinants. And he argues that in reality, our health is dependent on the state of our society and the distribution of power and resources within it. And perhaps nowhere was this seen uh, more clearly than in the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. And since uh, 2020, there have been a number of studies which have been published to help us to understand why we saw such rapid uh, manifestations of ethnic and racial disparities in COVID-19 and the intersection of racism and poverty on COVID-related health challenges. And this schematic from Zachary, I think, has been just really a, a clear distillation of, of how a structural racism interfaces with poverty and then how that results in both a higher prevalence of pre-existing health challenges, reduced access to health care, the housing conditions that people uh, are living in, as well as employment in high-risk occupations, which in turn resulted in differences in COVID-19 uh, risk and outcome. Um, and we saw through the COVID pandemic where we began to see a number of impacts of who was likely to be admitted and to develop severe disease and to die from COVID. So we saw clearly people who lived in overcrowded or multi-generational households, people who worked in jobs with increased risk of coming into contact with individuals who were at high risk of developing COVID, for example, health and care workers, uh, people who resided in poor parts of our cities were far more likely and urban, dense urban areas were far more likely to develop uh, COVID to have a higher risk of uh, becoming infected. We saw through both qualitative and quantitative studies where, that were 
studies that where we had a higher level of uh, stigma, low trust and low confidence and poor relationships or partnerships between communities and health and care systems, that those communities tended to be more affected by COVID-19. And again, through qualitative studies, the lived experiences of communities that had experienced racism and discrimination were again more likely to have a negative experience going through the pandemic. The next slide just highlights some of the data that we saw in England uh, as it relates to the COVID pandemic, which is well described now in the first wave of the pandemic, significant differences in uh, the likelihood of being diagnosed with COVID. Uh, uh, patterns which uh, maintained throughout most of the pandemic uh, and were exacerbated with successive waves of the pandemic. And the next slide highlights the differences that we observed in the first wave of the pandemic in differences across uh, in the likelihood of being diagnosed, the likelihood of dying from the disease, depending on your level of deprivation. So we saw significant differences if you lived in more deprived parts uh, of the country, you're much more likely to be diagnosed and to die from COVID. And we saw significant differences between males and females in these data as well. So again, these differences manifested themselves really early in COVID-19 and uh, persisted throughout. And as we went through the pandemic, we saw the persistence of these differences. So even when we looked at data to 2022, and you could look at the excess deaths and mortality from COVID-19, we see that Asian, Blacks and mixed groups had high levels of rates of registered deaths compared to whites. And the summary of deaths in England are presented on the right-hand side of the chart, just showing you some of the detail around uh, the differences in terms of registered deaths, COVID deaths, and excess deaths by racial and ethnic groups. And again, you see significantly higher levels of uh, registered compared to expected deaths uh, for Asian, Black, and mixed groups compared to white groups in the UK. So in the final part of the talk, I wanted to quickly reflect on how do we take the experience of COVID to fundamentally do things differently um, uh, in addressing and incorporating, addressing structural racism in the work that we're doing. There are many lessons from the pandemic and uh, very happy to, I'm sure this will be discussed in the uh, conversation that we have today, but clearly looking at how we place uh, tackling uh, inequalities at the forefront of our health and care systems is a key lesson from the pandemic. The partnerships which have been built up through the pandemic really enabled us to think differently about uh, how we work together in health and care systems with communities to address and respond to threats, but also to address inequalities as well. We were able to use new kinds of data integrate different kinds of data and to be more agile in data to help us to define and evaluate our programs. This might be a true legacy of the pandemic and an opportunity for us to use data differently to understand and to respond to inequalities. And of course, the type of research that was done throughout the pandemic were really provided us with an opportunity to to correct some of the imbalances in research and scientific portfolios, both to engage communities uh, more effectively and to include more diversity within trials and studies, but also to do the kinds of research that matter most to communities. And a final lesson from the pandemic has been the work to uh, strengthen our community-centered approaches to, to tackling health inequalities as well, really building in asset-based approaches to community development in our work. We've done a lot of work in uh, uh, working in the London system to understand uh, systematically what works in tackling structural racism. Uh, again, I won't have time to go through these in any great detail today, but the literature is now developing in terms of uh, uh, interventions that can be delivered both at the individual level, social and community networks, uh, in the healthcare settings and services, and finally, uh, what you can do to intervene through living and working conditions. And this body of evidence is allowing us to think through uh, the range of tools which are in the toolkit that can be used to address uh, and tackle uh, structural racism. So in the next few slides, I'm going to end by discussing a framework for anti-racism in public health and why this is so important. So it's really, key that we move beyond simply 
talking about and defining and naming racism, but being far more proactive in the ways in which we identify challenge and change of values and structures and behaviours which are perpetuating racism uh, within our systems. So anti-racism is a really active way of both seeing and being in the world, uh, and being in our systems and being able to transform and address and respond to racism. Uh, the literature is now developing in terms of the range of interventions which are available for uh, anti-racist approaches, approaches for individuals and organizations. Uh, and in the next slide, I just want to highlight a few components of what uh, anti-racism is and what it might mean. So anti-racism is really about being a much more and taking a much more proactive stance to um, dealing with and addressing racism. It is about becoming aware of how racism affects the lived experiences of people of color within our society. It's about recognizing the systematic nature of racism, the historical and societal foundations of it, how it's manifested in terms of individual attitudes and behaviors, and how it influences the development of policies and practices within institutions. So really being aware of both the experiences of individuals, but also how is racism operating within my organization, within my community, and why is it so and what might be done? It also calls for um, a recognition of privilege and to have that conversation of why some communities are systematically advantaged and others are disadvantaged and how that advantage may play out, uh, both in terms of supporting the perpetuation of racism, but how to have conversations with communities that are privileged to begin to understand the nature of privilege and to be able to find an opportunity to, to work uh, and to address that. So that's a key part of anti-racism. Now, in the next slide, there are a number of core principles which are really important for organizations in developing uh, anti-racism stance. I've just highlighted just a few here, just to show some of the key things which have been recommended from the literature, but also uh, other organizations in some of the approaches in becoming an anti-racist organization, important in integrating that into the stance and values of the organization, a clear leadership approach uh, and leadership narrative and voice on being uh, anti-racist. Uh, it's important to have a systematic approach to integrating anti-racism within the organization so that we're looking at organizations, processes, ways of working, people management policies. It's important to think about visible leadership, as I mentioned, and uh, all levels of the organization, executive, middle management, uh, supervisors, to be signed up to the anti-racism approach and to ensure that the behaviors are aligned. It's about creating safe spaces for uh, uh, the variety and diverse staff and uh, members of your organization to ensure that employees voices and the recognitions of the challenge recognition of the challenges that employees may face find a way to um, be recognized and valid within the organization as well and it's about ensuring that you're having a clear look at your people management approach from end to end to look at opportunities for addressing equality diversity inclusion uh, harassment and bullying creating safe spaces within the organization so really looking at people management approaches so again, anti-racism is a more proactive stance for organizations. This gives one framework that you can look at anti-racism through in and through, but there are other frameworks which are available as well. In London, we are implementing, and this will be my final slide, uh, anti-racism uh, across our health and care system. And this framework just shares with you the five pillars of that approach. It begins with a strong leadership commitment from health and care leaders in London towards anti-racism and or health and care leaders have made a public commitment to being anti-racist, board level review of strategy, monitoring objectives and indicators and ensuring that they're implementing an anti-racist approach in all policies. So really working with our NHS local authority partners on the leadership aspect of this work. Next is really looking at workforce, using the power of data to monitor and act on health inequalities in uh, uh, recruitment, uh, retention, well-being, as well as promotional opportunities, providing more systematic training and support to address work 
cultural biases within the workplace, to address discrimination within the workplace, and to create safe spaces, and to look at robust monitoring of equality, diversity, and inclusion policies as well. The third pillar of our approach in London is around developing uh, robust health equity programs. So really building upon our experience of the pandemic to ensure that we're using the anti-racist lens on our key equity programs uh, delivered to Londoners. So whether this is our programs through our Core 20 Plus 5 or health improvement programs, uh, using other frameworks to tackle inequalities, for example, the Marmot framework, really ensuring that we're applying those as well, but ensuring that there's good data available for us to evaluate the impact of our work and to think about how we uh, continue to integrate the personalized approach to developing culturally competent interventions. The fourth pillar is uh, focused on um, leveraging the power of the NHS and local authorities as anchor institutions and through their ability to commission from the local economy, to employ from uh, the local community, to be a key player in tackling some of the social and structural determinants of health. And by being the largest uh, employers in many communities, they have an ability through their work, workplace policies, uh, through providing a living wage, through the work and conditions that they provide to begin to create a safer environment for communities and opportunities for communities uh, to um, be introduced to the health and care system and of course to um, as, a, as a key opportunity to getting a well-paid job a good job in a great environment so really thinking about the role as anchor institutions and then finally to uh, ensure that work within the health and care system is prioritizing the excellent work that we did through the pandemic in terms of working with communities to rebuild confidence and trust. And this includes strengthening the ways in which we're integrating communities in the decisions, design and delivery of healthcare services to strengthen the co-production work that we started in the pandemic and to ensure that we continue to invest in the sort of community infrastructure through social prescribing or voluntary uh, sector systems, uh, community partnerships on the boards and decision-making bodies within the NHS continue to develop that work as well. So five pillars of our practice in London that we are now rolling on as part of our anti-racist approach in, in the city. So colleagues, I'm going to end uh, just after this slide. The next slide, it just is a summary slide. Uh, really just wanted to highlight and to reflect today on definitions of race and racism, the importance of structural racism, why we're framing it as a public health issue. Wanted to use our experience of COVID to highlight both how racism operates and how it can uh, manifest itself, both in terms of the models of how it impacts the health and care system. And we looked at COVID as an example of where that was really exacerbated and exemplified. And then I wanted to end by just sharing with you a framework for uh, thinking through implementing anti-racist approaches within health and care systems and the role that public health practitioners will play in that. My final slide is a call to our action, which I promised that I'd do. Uh, and this is what I'm asking for all of you today. The first is that we say it, uh, that we begin to name racism, to say the word actually out loud, to be able to uh, describe it and to understand why it's a public health issue and why it's important for us to uh, be addressing it. So your work and your leadership as, uh, as health and care leaders to create the spaces for us to say this are critically important. Second, I'm asking you to see it. Uh, to ask how might racism uh, be operating here, um, whether you're working in a small or large setting, the ways in which you're able to um, support colleagues and work with others to understand the power dynamics, the advantage, the privilege, the disadvantages that different groups within your organization might be facing. And then finally, to 
act on it. And that's the third ask that I have for you today, which is to whether individually or as organizations to commit to using your individual power to doing, to, doing things differently. Uh, and we're appropriate to use your collective action to inform, support, and protect uh, everyone that you're caring for, but in your organization that you have the privilege of working with as well. So see it, say it, see it, and act on it. Um, a call to action for you all today. Uh, Michelle Obama is my final hero. Uh, and she has a quote that says, you know, you see, our glorious diversity and our diversity of faiths and colors and creeds is not a threat to who we are. It makes us who we are. And I think it's such a wonderful way to, to pull this together. It's so important that we work together to address this. It's so important that we find the honesty to have these difficult conversations. And it's so important that we work together to create a better future for us all. Paul, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I hope that was clear and that the technology didn't fail me, but I look forward to the discussion today. Thanks. Kevin, it was very clear and uh, yeah, we heard you loud and clear and you'll see lots of hands of uh, clapping hands and appreciation. If only we were here live, uh, you'd be hearing that very, very clearly indeed. Um, thank you so much. There are lots of questions but I think we should possibly allow you a moment just to draw breath while I introduce the panelists and I'll invite them to just reflect on what they've heard and indeed what they are doing uh, as, as we think about your challenge to say it, see it and act on it. So I'm going to start by asking Lake Kalik. Lake, if you would like to join us here um, if we can bring you in. Yep, thank you very much. If you would just introduce yourself and invite you to reflect briefly on what you have heard from Kevin this afternoon. Thanks, Lake. Thank you very much uh, for that, Paul. Uh, and uh, a really um, heartfelt thank you to Professor Kenton for uh, an inspiring uh, and thought-provoking talk. Um, so my name is Lake, Lake Kalik. Uh, and I'm speaking today in my capacity as chair of NHS Scotland's uh, National Ethnic Minority Forum, uh, or EMF for short. Um, now, the EMF was set up um, about two years ago at the height of the COVID pandemic um, to act really as a stronger collective voice for equality within NHS Scotland. Uh, and it's composed of ethnic minority local network chairs and other ethnic minority representatives from across NHS Scotland's boards, uh, that is territorial boards and non-territorial boards. And the EMF's aim was really to increase the awareness of the difference in experience for minority ethnic employees uh, within uh, NHS Scotland uh, and become an effective mechanism for workforce engagement, uh, driving change, uh, as well as providing a really valuable engagement point uh, for some of the um, really difficult issues that were discussed by Professor Kenton earlier on uh, from a public health perspective, uh, and also looking at racialized health inequalities uh, uh, in order to influence those three Ps that again, Professor Kenton mentioned, policies, practices, uh, and pathways. Um, and finally, I really wanted everyone on this call to personalize uh, this information uh, 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 and some aspects of the talk that we heard today from Professor Kenton uh, and give you um, uh, my view uh, as chair of the EMF. So NHS Scotland is one of the most ethnically diverse workforces in the country. It is, however, uh, an organization in which ethnic minority staff are consistently underrepresented at senior leadership level. And in Scotland, uh, whilst the recruitment of ethnic minority staff within the NHS is increasing, uh, particularly within the recruitment of international staff, lack of senior ethnic minority appointments across our sector is a stark reminder of some of the complex barriers to progression that were touched on by Professor Kenton earlier on. 
There are no ethnic minority chief executives within NHS Scotland and representation at the executive board level remains stubbornly low at a level that indicates a clear structural and historical bias that favours certain individuals over others. And I want us to reflect on that um, because that is an example of structural racism within NHS Scotland. Uh, and I don't think we should shy away from that fact. The data tell, tells us that NHS Scotland is a structurally racist organization. Thank you. Thank you, Lake, for that challenge, which I know, uh, well, there are lots of questions coming through and I'm keen to get onto them uh, shortly. So let me move uh, directly to hear from uh, Dr. Safia Qureshi. Uh, Safia, could I invite you to come in now? Thank you. Thank you, Paul, and um, thank you, Kevin. Um, so I'm going to pick up a theme there that, uh, that Lake just started on. Um, I'm a director at Healthcare Improvement Scotland, so one of the national boards um, in Scotland. And I became an active member of my organisational and the National Ethnic Minority Forums very late in my career. Um, and that's something that, um, you know, when I look back and think about what that why there was, the change for me came from a challenge from somebody else who asked me the question, are you the most senior woman of colour who isn't a clinician in the NHS in Scotland? So lots of, lots of steps to that question. And the answer I think was yes, but it had a very profound reaction on me because I was a bit ashamed that I hadn't asked myself that question. I was struck by the fact that the answer was probably yes. And I felt a responsibility that I'd never felt before to do something about that and to become more um, visible. Um, until then, I'd been, as um, Afua Hirsch describes very well in her book, British, someone who'd learned how to manage and tone down my difference, um, often subconsciously and sometimes necessarily very consciously. I look back and I think what I missed out on, and I actually see it as another manifestation of structural racism, to be honest. Um, I felt too anxious about how it might be perceived if I started or if I joined a local minority ethnic forum. And now that I'm part of several, I love it. I love the community of supportive, like-minded, caring and passionate compassionate people that I've found. So I'd like to add another action to the one that you were given by Kevin to sign up with your local network, either as a member or as an ally and see what you can do to, to start taking things forward. When it comes to actions at systems level, I feel much more frustrated um, as Lake's uh, touched on already. There are so many records of good intentions or worthy papers highlighting the need for change. And I'm just gonna reference to, I hope you don't mind, 2016, a paper was published in the journal Social Science and Medicine called Obstacles to Race Equality in the English National Health Service. It interviewed senior uh, leaders in England and found that many managers and teams didn't consider tackling ethnic health inequalities to be part and parcel of their job. They lacked the confidence and skills to do so. And they actually questioned the legitimacy of such work. Um, all the interviewees felt that attention to ethnic diversity and equity was a marginal concern within English national healthcare policy. Um, and their findings highlighted the need for much more fundamental action and better education or better data collection, calling out the absence of clear national direction as problematic. So leadership was crucial. Um, and all of that, if you think about that, I think for those of us who are used to working in the health service, that suggests, oh, we need a strategy, we need a plan. Um, and again, I think that takes us into territory we've been in before. So it's the challenge we face, isn't it? So there was a paper published almost 10 years earlier to that one in 2007 by Professor Sarah Ahmed, and the paper was called, You End Up Doing the Document Rather Than Doing the Doing. It's a brilliant title, isn't it? And I think I'll stop there and say that is what I don't want us um, to do anymore. Thank you. Thank you so much. Some really important challenges for us there. Um, in a moment, I'd like to share a little bit about what Public Health Scotland is seeking to do in this space. But before I do so, let me also bring in our final panellist, Richard Fogel. Richard, can I invite you to uh, share your perspectives at this stage? Thank you. Hi, thanks uh, very much, Paul. I'm Richard Fogel. I'm the co-director of Population Health at the Scottish Government. And with uh, Safia, I'm the um, co-chair of um, the Racialised Health Inequalities and Health and Social Care Steering Group. 
um, a huge thank you to both Professor Fenton and, and the faculty for bringing this to us. Uh, we need more of this uh, and we need more of a sense uh, of uh, community and, and, and thank you to Lake and to Safia for already their contribution to this, uh, which is critical that, that, that we listen. Uh, and I want to start, Paul, just very briefly by picking up on the last thing that was said there. I, I, I have a script of things we've done. I, I don't think that's going to help this conversation. I'm a national policymaker and listening has to be active and we do, as Professor Fenton has said, say it, see it, act on it. And I, and I do worry that we are disgracefully late to a conversation in which um, we will respond with words. So in a sense, I'm going to put that to one side and say that I want to offer a personal commitment as a director of population health, working with you, Paul, and others with Lake and many colleagues on this call to really not make the same mistakes that um, Safi and others have um, have um, brought to our attention of just responding to these challenges and the incredible questions in the in the Q and A with a series of words. Words matter, but actually we need more to create the conditions in which those words can be meaningful. So I, I start with the idea of say it, um, and I think we do need to say the word racism. Uh, and I don't think we should respond to that with um, talk of, for instance, understanding ethnic diversity, et cetera. I think it's something deeper and more pernicious than that. And Professor Fenton has brought that out uh, as an issue that's not just an issue for ethnic minority uh, people in Scotland and, and in the UK, but Professor Fenton's bullet point that talked about the drag on the whole of society, the shared burden feels to me one in which we can avoid the, the othering of this problem and a sense of community. So I'm very happy mm -hmm. to take responsibility and personal leadership on this issue in relation to national policy. I'm very happy to facilitate discussions with Scotland's political class on this issue with Scottish ministers and others who share from the first minister down a real sense of needing to get past some of the barriers we faced. And I'm really excited about the prospect of working with Professor Fenton, the faculty and others on those, whether it's the six principles or the five pillars, looks to me like the, the London experience is one that we can learn from. So very, very keen to be in this conversation, Paul, humbled to be in this conversation and very keen to be part of the practical action that comes next. Thank you, Richard. All I would add from a public health Scotland perspective is that we are here as on a learning journey like so many others. So very specifically, we have asked the organisation CRER, the Coalition of Race, Equality and Rights, to help us in our work to become an anti-racist organisation, recognising what you've said, Kevin, about the leadership that health boards as anchor employers um, need to play. That work is now progressing. Um, it's involving discussion with many staff across Public Health Scotland. It's been uh, helped by our own uh, minority Ethnic Representation Network. Uh, some of the members of that are on the call today, I know, and I offer them my thanks for the leadership that they are demonstrating and heartily agree with what Lake has said about the importance of, uh, of networks, and indeed uh, endorsed by, by you, Sophia. Um, but it's, it's really specific work. It's looking at all of our policies and practices to understand and evaluate and challenge us on the extent to which they uh, might include elements of racism, and if they do, what needs to happen to change it. Um, the work is still a relatively early stage, but I'm under uh, no illusion that it is vital work and work that I hope in the coming weeks and months we will be able to share with other, pub with other health boards in Scotland and other bodies in Scotland um, as we, with you all, uh, seek to learn and become truly anti-racist in all that we do. Under no illusions, though, colleagues, that we have got a long way to go. But, Kevin, the, the, the talk you've given us absolutely helps us in it. 
So I want to take the last 20 minutes to get into some Q&A. Um, I'll direct the questions to you first, Kevin. And what I'll say is if panel members would like to come in with a follow-up comment, then if you could please use the raised hand facility, I will come to you. I'll get through as many as I can. So I'm going to some of the ones that came in earlier on. And Kevin, I'm going to ask first for the for your views on what I think was the second question. What advice can you provide for diversifying the public health workforce, particularly leadership positions in the public health workforce? Kevin. Thanks, Paul. Um, uh, can I just say before I jump in, thanks to like Safia and Richard, uh, fantastic comments and reflections. And thank you for bringing the passion and the focus for this work. That's exactly what we need. And Paul, I'm really excited to hear about what you're doing in Public Health Scotland and if the faculty can assist in any way and to be a champion for the work that you're doing, we would love to partner with you and to support you on this journey. Um, the diversification of the public health workforce is a real priority for us in the faculty. We know that as a faculty, we can do so much better. And in fact, when we looked at our examination process uh, for the selection of public health specialists, uh, we were beginning to see the impact of dif differential attainment and differential experiences of this selection process, even to enter public health training, specialty training in the UK. And so as a faculty, we are looking at how we address that. In addition, we want to ensure we work with UK PHR for other pathways for registration in public health and to promote that for all communities. And thirdly, we want to look at what are some of the specific needs that we may need to put in place working with our local partners to help people who may be interested in a public health career to understand how to navigate the system, how to prepare themselves well, so that when it comes to the selection and the process of supporting them through their career, um, we're doing that in a much more equitable way. So I think there are lots of things that we can do on the diversification of the workforce. It's a priority for us in the faculty and I know it is for the other public health bodies as well. Thanks, Kevin. I think you've also picked up the question that was asked later on in the chain. I'll try and group these a little. There was a question about how will the public health workforce and leadership become more diverse as it is majority white, middle class and from privileged backgrounds. I think you've picked up. I want to ask the question that followed immediately on from it. What role do minority ethnic networks have within an organisation to support the organisation to be anti-racist in everything? Could we hear your views on that, please, Kevin? Yes, absolutely. So first of all, I want to start with the opportunities and the responsibility of the organization to support their networks. Too often we see networks being created in a tokenistic way and that the advice and the challenge from networks about what the organization can do often falls on deaf ears. So the first responsibility is for organizations to create networks which are meaningful, which have a direct line to senior management, to the board and executive, that there's a dynamic process of uh, both briefing and engaging their networks, supporting their networks to be successful, and also supporting members of those networks to get the time uh, uh, and have the resources to participate effectively. So organizations must value networks for them to be effective. Then, once that's in place, then you can ask more for your networks. And your networks are there to help you to look at your policies. Uh, you may be dealing with challenging uh, programmatic issues to call upon the expertise of your networks, to uh, help you with your staff survey design, de de development of your action plans, thinking about how you tackle big issues such as um, uh, bullying, harassment uh, in the workplace, uh, but also sickness absence for people who are at the receiving end of working in hostile environments. Your networks are there to be your first point of call, your early warning system, and to be a co-producer in finding solutions. But the first thing, Paul, that has to be done is that the organization has to create viable and supportive environments for these networks to thrive. Great insight for us there, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, I know that we've, we're working to ensure that the network has a clear executive team ally and champion. And as, as, as chief executive, I see regular engagement with the network, a personal priority. But uh, Sophia, uh, let's hear from you and then from Lake on this issue. 
I think it's a nice opportunity to just build on what Kevin said there about the obligation to support the network, because one a lot of the feedback that we get as networks are often quite junior members of staff, um, and asking them to do the work is sometimes quite hard. Um, they may not be senior enough. They may not understand the you know the the way an organisation works uh, internally and the connections it has externally. They may not have the time. They may not have the experience or the confidence. So there is something about the organisation um, supporting the network if it is going to ask them these quite um, difficult questions. Um, and I also think there's something about wouldn't it be nice if the organisation could maybe be a bit more flexible in the rules and processes that it does have in place and let the network into more spaces and, and earlier. And I think that would be really helpful too. Thanks very much, uh, Safia and Lake. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to say, I am constantly amazed uh, about the, the depth uh, and breadth of experience uh, that is coming up from uh, local networks within health boards. Uh, and I guess uh, it's really, my question is, how can we use some of that experience uh, to make sure that um, we are doing the right thing when we are employing uh, or going through the recruitment process for senior people within, within the NHS? And I think it's really uh, important to ensure that there is uh, that element of diversity on those uh, panels uh, to ensure that we are absolutely picking uh, the right candidate and really looking at our own recruitment practices uh, and calling it out when uh, we're, we've already got somebody in mind for that post. Uh, calling out when you've got uh, uh, somebody uh, acting uh, up in the post already who has that unfair uh, advantage uh, that is uh, contributing towards that lack of, of diversity at senior level. So I think it's really important to bring some of these uh, issues to the fore and, and to use uh, our networks much more effectively within recruitment. Thank you so much, Lake. I'll see if Kevin wants to come back in on that point then. How can we make best use of our networks, uh, but particularly in the space around recruitment, Kevin? Mm, great. So thank you both for your comments. You know, ensuring that you hardwire in your networks into your governance of your organisation is going to be critical. So many organizations, when I ask to see their organograms, are very happy to talk about the board, the executive, the directorates and divisions, but what you often miss are the networks which are in place and how those networks are hardwired into how we do business around here in this organization. In other words, how networks influence the culture. So before PHE, Public Health England, ended, as a result of going through the pandemic, we really refined the ways in which we were working with our networks. I'm going to give you three examples, tangible things that we did differently. Number one, like to your point about recruitment, that we changed the policy in Public Health England, so we had to have diverse uh, panels um, and that the networks provided both a, a source for um, minority colleagues who were going to be part of the panel, but it was an expectation that when you're going to have panels for senior roles, that it had to be diverse. And the other thing that we did was to ensure that we had uh, training to all panel members before being on a panel to look at sort of implicit biases, systematic biases, but also best practices in recruitment as well. Second, we worked with the network to ensure that uh, we were able to commission work from and with the networks on some of the problem areas that they were picking up from our staff, bullying and harassment, um, unequal treatment or experiences going through competition for senior jobs and roles. So we use the intelligence and the insights from our networks to guide specific pieces of work commissioned by the organization to help to improve practice. And then as a result of that work developed with and through the network, we're able to amend policies. And again, that's why we change and how we change our recruitment. That's how we changed uh, the way we support staff. It helped us to think about the cultural competence of our external facing website, uh, the image 
images and the language that we have, etc. So, and, and these are things that we would not have seen had we not been working closely with our network. And then finally, I really want to pick up the point that Sophia mentioned, which is um, who's in the room in the network. You know, I've had the privilege of both leading networks, being a member of those networks, and then working as an executive. And it's really important that um, the network is seen not just something for the black and brown people to be involved with, but that it becomes all members of your organization to be engaged. Because remember, racism saps the strength of the entire society. It saps the strength and effectiveness of your entire organization. If your staff are going off sick because they're dealing in a hostile environment, the entire organization is affected. So the ways in which you not only support your minority staff to be involved in your networks, but you open the doors for everyone who's interested in being part of this is a social justice issue. It's a justice issue for staff. And that brings capacities, it talks about development of allies and allyship, it begins to think about framing of this issue that allows for people who are in the advantage group to find their voice in dealing with and talking about these tough issues. So Paul, three examples there of tangible ways in which networks made a difference for us uh, in our experience in London. Thank you so much, Kevin. Great to have those practical examples. Many of us will have involvement with networks in Scotland, and I hope there are things we take away from that and apply either in our involvement with networks or indeed in our involvement with executive teams, given that a lot of the challenges are for um, our exec teams. Um, I want to move on to a couple of questions that focus on um, Scotland as a whole. Uh, one is, uh, let me just read out this one, Kevin. In Scotland, and to a lesser extent in England, all-cause mortality rates tend to be lower among many minority ethnic groups, with white Scottish people having particularly poor outcomes. This is sometimes incorrectly used as evidence against there being important health inequalities. What are your thoughts about this? And how should we best reflect these complexities in debates and in policy? Mm -hmm. Such a great question. And it's one that we are um, developing our approach in England to discuss as well. Uh, so you're absolutely right that we have these differences in um, mortality uh, across racial and ethnic groups. And it therefore is incorrect, especially in the UK, to say that black and minority ethnic groups as a, as a constituency have higher mortality rates than whites because it's not true. And in fact, it varies across racial and ethnic groups. And this is because of a number of reasons. One, it may reflect patterns of migration to the United Kingdom. A lot of our communities may be coming from areas which have lower risk behaviors compared to the white British population. And those risk behaviors, whether it's use of alcohol or smoking uh, prevalence, may be lower in our minority communities. And then that has an impact on uh, morbidity and mortality. It also reflects the demographic profile of the country. So, um, you know, many of our minority communities tend to be younger uh, than the white British majority. That may have an impact on overall mortality rates. But again, when you look at age adjusted mortality rates, you can still see differences as well. And then finally, remember that you do have some conditions which are more uh, socially patterned uh, and uh, patterned across uh, racial and ethnic groups. So, whether it's sickle cell disease, for example, in African and Caribbean groups, or whether it is um, uh, diabetes, as I mentioned in, in Asian groups, and that can have an impact on differential mortality rates. So first thing is recognizing that this is true, that we see differences in, in um, uh, adjusted mortality rates. Second, to have a crisp explanation as to why this occurs. Third, the fact that your overall mortality rate may seem better in some ethnic groups than others does not mean that there still don't exist inequalities in prevalence of risk behaviors, prevalences of diseases, and prevalence of differential outcomes. So the overall AMR does not take away from and should not take away from inequalities which exist along the health and care pathway, which I've identified and discussed today. Thanks, Paul. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, thank you. There's clearly a desire to hear a little bit more about the work that you've referred to in London. So let me just 
uh, set out two questions there, which will give you an opportunity to say something about that. And then, we're, uh, colleagues, we will finish bang on five, I promise. So we'll see whether or not there's time for another question. And apologies already. There's, I, I'm, I'm getting messaged lots of questions, and I'm sorry we're only covering some of them. Here's one. Thinking about operationalising the London approach, could Kevin give one or two examples of positive actions under the headings of becoming anchor institutions or working with communities to achieve confidence and trust? And another related one is, what has been your experience of closing the loop and embedding accountability into the London approach to anti-racism? So some examples there are being sought around anchors, working with communities and embedding accountability. Kevin, would you have some thoughts for us there, please? Yes, absolutely. And I love giving examples and stories, but we only have three minutes, so I'll be really quick. So Anchor Institutions, a big program across the NHS and local authority partners in London to pay the London living wage to staff. Uh, and that means that in the lowest bands uh, uh, of staff working in, in, in the NHS and in local authorities, we are committing as a system to ensure that not only are they paid the minimum wage by contractors or by the NHS, but the London living wage, which is higher. That has a huge impact on lifting individuals and families out of poverty because we're paying uh, and ensuring fair wages for everybody working within the health and care system. So that's a, a concrete example. Uh, we currently are rolling that out across the system at the moment. That's a huge cost, you can imagine, on systems to get everybody paid the London living wage as a minimum, but it's a commitment of the system. And then my example of programs with communities. As a result of our experience with the COVID-19 pandemic, the NHS invested additional resources to ensure that the lessons of our COVID vaccination program uh, were learned and then implemented with our screening, immunization uh, and other pre prevention programs. So that's the London Vaccine Equity and Legacy Program. You can search for it online, but you see there where we have built in community-centered approaches to um, uh, build trust, to uh, build health literacy around vaccinations, and more recently screening, where we're using culturally competent approaches with language, images, channels for media engagement with our communities, and we're developing a resource for all of London to use and to have access to these culturally competent tools that we've developed. And this is a program that has been running for the past couple of years. It comes to a close, but it will be a part of how we do business moving forward. And then finally, the accountability for the system. We're still in the early phases of rolling things out. We've had a, uh, the agreement that this is a strategy for London, the sign off by the ICS in England, the integrated care system chairs and chief execs, chief execs of trusts. What we're developing are uh, monitoring system to see ways in which uh, this is going to be integrated and to create spaces in our executive leadership um, meetings within the system where we've put and we keep anti-racism and health inequalities and structural determinants of health as part of the leadership conversation that London has moving forward. And we'll use the metrics to show partners how we're progressing as a system in terms of the uh, progress on our key pillars. So that's what we're doing in London. Thanks, Paul. Kevin, um, so interesting. We have got lots to learn and we have got lots of work to do in Scotland, clearly. Uh, I think we've been helped in taking that work forward by this session today. So let me thank all of the panellists uh, for your contributions. Uh, thank you, Safia. Thank you, uh, Lake and thank you, Richard. Uh, let me thank the Glasgow Centre for Population Health and the Faculty of Public Health for putting this session on. And particular thanks to you, Kevin, for uh, providing us with this address and for the challenges that you brought to us. We look forward to continuing the conversation, but crucially ensuring that action follows on from it. Thank you to you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, very much appreciated and very best wishes. Thank you.